Hey. Are you actually ready to talk about it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm ready. I have a lot of exciting stories I want to tell, but first I need to get the biggest and the hardest one out of the way first. This is a backstory in the events that led me to the dream of surf photography and how I made it come true. I moved to San Diego in early 2016, but it was an accident. I had no intention of living there. To make sense of everything, I need to go a bit back in time. I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, an island in the Bay called Alameda. My parents had three kids, myself, a younger brother, Travis, and my older sister, Natalie. For as long as I can remember, my parents had disagreements and fought. Like all toxic relationships that go on too long, eventually the bubble burst. My dad was a live TV operator at a local news broadcast station, and my mom was a stellar real estate agent. Eventually, my dad left his job and went on disability for PTSD from what he saw on a job. Then my parents separated, and then we sold our house. Over the younger years of my adolescence, most of my daily life was spent going to court, court-appointed therapists, and listening to two sides of arguments while I bounced between the two homes of joint custody. We lived in multiple rental homes and moved often. I only knew a few ways to block out the noise and frustration, and most of the time it was spent on video games. When the housing market began to fail, my mom was already ready to leave her job. She noticed it like a sixth sense in 2007. And by this time, my dad had convinced the court and most of my family that he wasn't fit to be a father. My mom decided to move back to her home country of South Africa and wanted to take us with her. Being the stubborn middle child that I was at the age of 14 going into high school, I put my meaningless foot down. I wasn't going to move to a country that I knew nothing about right before high school, but I wasn't going to live with my dad either, who I hated being around. I had convinced a couple of my friend's parents to take me into two separate homes during my freshman year. My mom and my siblings had moved to South Africa without me in 2008. I wasn't well behaved and I had a lot of issues. The first friend's home politely asked me to leave after six months, and the second friend's home decided to move away shortly after. I was on a court-appointed order to stay within the school district and had no option after that but to move in back with my dad. The last three years of high school were spent making bad decisions, barely getting by in school, and trying to block out the negativity at home. Video games helped me a lot, but it also kept me inside for hours on end and within the walls of toxicity at home. I needed an excuse to stay away from home and a reason to stay outdoors. I got really into riding my bicycle around the Bay Area. Long rides and exploring the suburban and city areas, but mostly along the water and the estuaries and the ports in the East Bay. Sometimes there would be some just really moving scenes that I would ride past. These moments would pull me away from the never-ending growth of depression that, at the time, I didn't really understand was getting worse and worse. Eventually, I started taking this small Panasonic Lumix point-and-shoot camera with me on the rides. When it came time for college applications, I bombed the SAT. And my father had no interest in helping me with college applications. I couldn't afford the fees to blindly attempt the applications either. As graduation for high school approached, my dad continued to threaten how he was moving to Colorado when my school was done, and I had no choice but to go with him. I didn't have much professional knowledge on how to get a job, how to apply, or even make a little side hustle money. I had pretty much zero dollars in my name and a bank account I didn't know how to access. The day after my high school graduation in 2012, we packed our rental house into a box truck and moved to Creed, Colorado. During the move, I wasn't allowed to pack much, so I got rid of probably over 80% of my belongings and memories. When we got to Colorado, we actually stayed in a hotel for a few months in South Fork. We had just moved to a new state with no place to stay. 
Luckily, I still had my camera and my bicycle, and we arrived in late June, so it was decent enough weather to cycle around. Eventually, we got a rental home in the dead center of Creed. Creed is a small mountain town with a population of 257 people at 8,800 feet elevation. I think that number of people is just for the summertime. I didn't spend much time doing anything besides cycling, taking photos, and video games. We had very limited internet because of the isolation of the area, but I also didn't want to look at social media. All of my friends from high school were enjoying their summers, starting college, and starting their lives. I tried to get a job in the few places that operated as a business, but I'm under the impression that my dad convinced them that I'm useless and not worth hiring. I didn't have many warm clothes, and our rental home didn't stay warm often. The looming darkness of cabin fever began. I had fallen into a deep depression, and every day was an internal argument about suicidal thoughts. There was a stretch of several months where I didn't see a mirror, and eventually when I did, I didn't recognize myself. We got a beagle, jazz, before the first snow hit. I would walk him half a block sometimes before having to carry him back in from his paws freezing. When the true cold of winter set in, there were mornings that we would wake up in negative 35 degree temperatures, and sometimes the front door wouldn't open from being frozen shut. Cabin fever just met its perfect match, the frozen cold. By this point in time, I was barely conscious of my own personality and myself as a person. My father allowed his proclaimed PTSD to unravel into a monster, fueled by the dark walls that enclosed us in the small mountain town. Eventually one day, the snap came, a completely unhinged event. All my fears, ideas, and hatred towards my father became a reality as he let loose on myself and the dog. I held my ground with what little reason I had left to live and powered through the most brutal PTSD-sparked event that I had ever experienced with him. In doing this, he actually scared away whatever was inside of me that made me want to kill myself out of me. I went into fight or flight and went to the sheriff's office. The sheriff could do nothing as it was a small domestic issue in a small town. I truly believed if I stayed any longer, my father would kill me. When I got back home, I reached out to the few connections I had on Facebook with a plea for help. Within five hours, my sister, who lived in South Africa, reached out to my half-brother, Jason. Same father, different mother, who lived in Texas. Jason then called me and we made a plan. He drove up immediately with his wife and his six-month-old kid. I grabbed a couple things, the dog, and we arrived in Austin in a couple days. After recovering from the shell shock of those few days, I had to figure shit out. I earned my keep at my half-brother's place by getting my first job ever. The only place in the neighborhood that would take me. A junkyard. A few months spent working in the hot summer sun of Austin, Texas. Word eventually got out in the family of what went down, and my father's sister reached out. At this point, everyone on my dad's side of the family had cut him off. My aunt offered to pay for a flight to South Africa to live with my mom and my siblings. I found a new home for my Beagle Jazz, who was renamed to Blue. By August 2013, I landed in Durban, South Africa, and saw my mom for the first time since 2008. There was a lot of happiness, but I had a lot of baggage. Not just from what happened in Colorado, but from the years building up to it as well. Living in South Africa was tough, but it was different. The family aspect was so big and so strong there. It was my entire mom's side of the family. My mom was working hard to pay the bills, my little brother was in high school, and my older sister was in college down the south coast. I had to help out to live there. I found my first restaurant job at a Thai restaurant where I worked for several years. I worked for long hours and during the grind, I questioned my present and my past. Depression never went away. I had no goals or aspirations. Then one day, my cousin Cameron asked me to come surf with him down at the beach in Durban. It went horrible. I wasn't scared, but I hated duck diving. I found myself often in a mad swim, chasing down the board when I would lose it. That was fun. I would go down to the beach with Cameron ever so often, sometimes with a few friends, and sometimes with family. I never really got better at surfing until I moved to San Diego. But we're not there yet. After working and saving up enough, I bought my first Nikon DSLR, a D3200. I would use it as much as I could. The surf side of our family definitely caught notice of it and asked me to take photos of them surfing from the beach. 
it was a blast. And I kept doing it each time they would go. And each time I would surf, I would think, man, I should have just brought the camera. I found myself during the few free days from work I had looking for documentaries on surf photography. And then I found the fiberglass and megapixels movie. I probably watched it two or three times that day. I remember going over to Cameron's house shortly after that and I was fidgeting all over. I figured it out. I know what I want to do. There was a local water housing company at the time called Brother Housings. Camera water housings were not cheap. I had no experience with them and I was not in great physical shape. I instantly made goals to save up, swim laps each day, and practice breath holds. The concept of purchasing the housing became my entire existence. Eventually, I saved up enough, pulled the trigger, and I was taking in-water photos. The first day I took it out, I didn't tighten the bolts enough on the back plate, and I had a water leak instantly. I swam back in, diagnosed the issue, and contacted the housing manufacturer. He said, yeah, man, you gotta tighten the bolts all the way. And now I was set. I was happy and excited. Something that I hadn't felt in over a decade. I didn't know how to make it more than a hobby, so I kept working in restaurants and slowly dreamed of making it back to California. Life could be tough at times in South Africa with all the positives going on there were major xenophobia attacks, power grid failures, and an economy that struggled to keep up with the modern world. I weighed my options and it seemed best for any kind of future I had to be in the US. With the RAND, the South African currency, it seemed nearly impossible to save up enough working endlessly at the restaurants. At the time I was living there, there was not a minimum wage. In 2016, they passed a bill for the first minimum wage at $1.59 an hour. I kept my head down and just grinded away. I took surf photos that made me happy, and I worked. Then, one day, the last person that I would want to talk to reaches out to me. It's my dad. He tried making amends despite the weight of resentment that I felt each time I thought of him. I hated him. He was a good manipulator though. So eventually we got to talking. He knew my weakness. He offered me to help pay for college if I came to live with him for a little bit. It was an extremely tough decision. I couldn't expect to get any kind of career job in South Africa with zero experience besides shifting through metal in a junkyard and remembering 20 orders during a dinner rush. This was my only pathway forward. I agreed to it, but I needed time. He flipped the switch and gave me the ultimatum that if I didn't hop on a plane that week, the deal was off. I flew back to Colorado. In my head, this time was different. I was stronger. I had worked in horrible conditions with horrible people. I was in control of my mind and my body. I cycled in the snow. I took photos at night in the below freezing temperatures. My little brother agreed to come back with me as he had just finished high school and would be able to go to college too. We actually believed it. He flew over to Colorado a few months later. Travis, my younger brother, who's three years younger than me, was too young at the time to remember what my dad was like before he moved to South Africa in 2008. I told Travis the stories and he had his doubts. He didn't believe it. Unfortunately, when Travis arrived in Colorado, he began to understand and realize the lies. Somehow in the toxicity of the household, the three of us, myself, my little brother, and my dad, planned a road trip to go tour college campuses. The goal was to go to the Grand Canyon, to UCSD, and then stopping at campuses up the coast of California, and then head east, back to Colorado. In March of 2016, we passed the border of California after going to the Grand Canyon. We stayed at a trailer park for a day in Chula Vista with the vehicle that we were traveling in. Travis and I met up with a family friend that our mother had worked with back in the Bay Area, Amanda. She owned a French-Italian restaurant called the Bella Vista Social Club and Cafe that sits between the Salk Institute and the Sanford Consortium by the Glider Port. We had lunch there. Our dad didn't want to show his face there because he was our mother's friend, so he dropped us off there. Amanda connected us with Steve, who was a visiting scholar at SIO. Scripps Institute of Oceanography. 
She gave us a quick tour of the Scripps campus. While researching campuses before the road trip, I looked at beaches nearby to work on my surf photography. I read about Black Beach, but I didn't know much about it other than it had a big cliff. When her dad picked us up from the tour at Scripps, I wanted to go out and check out Black's. I had no idea how to get there, but as our dad drove towards La Jolla Cove into rush hour traffic, I couldn't help but realize we were going the wrong way. Trying to convince him that we were on the wrong route, we ended up in a heated argument. It got worse and worse, screaming. Travis hadn't seen the snap yet. Travis began to hyperventilate and started screaming as well. The car was moving down a side road as Travis freaked out and opened the car door. He jumped out and the car slowed down. Travis was on the ground having a seizure. I froze up. We made a lot of noise in all of that though. Thankfully, it wasn't a quiet neighborhood and someone on the sidewalk saw the commotion and ran over. They asked if everything was okay. My dad responded in the most manipulating and suspicious way possible that everything was fine. Don't worry, go away. Minutes later, an ambulance showed up and I don't think it was my dad who called it. Someone talked to the driver of the ambulance and I hopped in. When we were in the hospital, my brother called me in to see him. He was okay. He told the nurse in a panic, I can't go back with my dad, red flag. They called in a social worker. We had nothing with us. The social worker asked if we had anyone we could call. We had no one. Thoughts ran through my head. This was the next step of the never ending roller coaster. But I was ready for it. In a panic of thoughts, we reached out to Amanda, who we had lunch with earlier that day, and told her the whole story. Keep in mind, this was the first time that we saw Amanda or talked to her since we were small children in Alameda. She picked us up from the hospital and took us into her home for a few months with her kid who was in elementary school. We found a way to get the few belongings we had with us on the road trip back from our dad. Amanda gave us jobs at the restaurant. We worked our asses off. Travis and I moved out into our own apartments. On my off days from work, I would walk to the beach at Scripps or Black's with a duffel bag of my surf photography gear. Eventually, I got a bicycle. I put my head to the grind to make the surf photography dream a reality by working in restaurants and retail shops and real estate offices. And now, over a decade later, doing what I love the most. Looking back, I would revisit the hatred I have for my father, but I also remembered the lack of love that I had for myself. These horrible moments that I went through taught me to be strong. I used to tell myself that I lost so many years of my life so far, dealing with all of that nonsense. For years on end, these memories of dark thoughts and moments eventually stopped haunting me and became the driving force of my motivation and determination. It was a volcano of ambition from the core of my heart that would burn, explode, and melt everything that got in my way. Never again would I hit rock bottom.